I came in so blind into that space. It was in Alaska, Cordoba. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Didn't know what to expect. Didn't know what was creating these waves. Garrett McNamara just kept it hush hush, like, don't tell anybody, just get here. And when I got there and saw what it was, and when this big one fell, and I nailed the whole sequence of like, what happened with the ice calving and this wave forming and these guys surfing in a river, this freezing cold water, death defying, literally death defying, like if it just fell out, it would have killed everybody. I just decided to go out like this as opposed to down, which it did. Everyone was gonna be, everyone was gonna die. It was so dangerous. And I felt like it was kind of like a war zone and that there was like shrapnel and pieces of ice flying out and you know, it was scary. And there were big bears all around where I was. I didn't have my water housing. All my stuff didn't come. I had a full like five, six millimeter wetsuit, helmet, life vest. All that stuff didn't make it. So all I had was my carry-on camera gear. Got there, nailed the shots. Basically, we stayed like three more days and nothing else really happened. But that first five minutes, I got this sequence of this wave crashing and uh, or this ice calving and this wave forming. That was the one that went worldwide. This is all before social, but it went all over the place, like news. I, I literally started getting calls from New York, LA. They want to fly me in to the studio to do interviews. And I kind of regret now not doing it. But at the time, Garrett McNamara and Kaylee Mamala were both, they, it was their story to be, you know, I felt like they should tell the story. And of course, the day after we go to Alaska, they jump on a plane and go to Indo, to the Mentawis in no man's land. No one can get a hold of them, no email, no cell phone, nothing, they're gone. So for a month, they went there and the story kind of came and went. They got some PR out of it later, but I was the next closest thing and everyone started calling me like, can you come to this interview? We want to hear more about this, we want to see your photos. And I just kind of was like, you know what? You really need to talk to Garrett and Kelly. It's their thing. I just documented it. But looking back now, I documented it. Therefore, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I should be like, I should be able to talk about it. That was still, to me, one of the craziest, coolest, stupidest shoots I've ever done in my life. But actually 100% worked out that my gear didn't show up because I probably would have gone out on the jet ski and depending on what lens I had on, it would have been one camera, one lens, because I would have been with a Pelican case in the water. It might not have been the right scenario and focal length. So as it turns out, I had a 7200 zoom on the edge of the river on a tripod. So that was all I had, my backpack, my tripod, I carried on. I always carry on my essentials, whatever I can get by with and shoot, carry that with me, that's it. So when I land, I can still shoot and then everything else is kind of like secondary. So luckily it worked out that I had that, got on the side of the beach and I shot with a 7200. Therefore I could zoom in and pull back, tell the story of the, like this giant glacier and kind of pull in and get the surfer. And it worked out perfectly. I feel like if I had been on the jet ski, one, I might've had a heart attack because oh, it was so scary. I did go on the jet ski the next day when my stuff got there and like my heart was beating like out to here because I was so scared and it starts cracking and popping and when it starts to fall, it's like dynamite and they've had 50 foot waves there before in a river that's, you know, 200, 300 yards wide. So it's kind of a spooky scenario. I felt like it just worked out that I happened to have that lens on at that particular time and I was ready to shoot because I nailed the shot and I don't know, had I been on the jet ski with a wide angle lens, it might've been too far away. I wanted to go on a surf trip to hit Southern Tahiti there, but I had this big hole in my foot where I'd stepped on an anchor three weeks prior. I mean, it was a nasty gaping hole. I had duct tape and I was worried about the tropics, like infecting it and getting some sort of staph infection or whatever. So I was a little nervous, but I just thought, all right, I'll just go there and I'll sit in the boat and I'll keep it covered up. We'll get some shots. And Alex Gray said, well, listen, let's go. 
but there's a right I want to shoot further from Chopes. Like, it's not the typical way where everyone goes and big left that everyone kind of knows about. It's like 30 minutes past that. And I know the right, I went there years ago, but wasn't that good. So I was like, all right, do I want to go sit there on that right by ourselves and shoot? Or do I want to shoot like, there was two dozen of the top pros in the world surfing the left. Just pristine, consistent, perfect lefts, peeling through, peeling through, peeling through. And I hadn't been there in a few years. Last time I was there was Code Red when it was just massive. I was excited to go back, but I get there, we jump on the boat, we go out, and I remember we went past Chopes and we all laid down in the boat and hid. And just the driver goes, drives by, we go out all the way, and you gotta go all around the pass and deep down the reef. And there's no way to get there except by boat or jet ski, because it's the end of the roads here, which is Chopu, that means like, Teopu means like the end of the road. And that's the wave here, and there's no more roads. So after that, you're hiking through the jungle and through like thick Tahitian mountain. We take the boat around there, we sit on it, the wave's gorgeous, but the playing field's like a football field. There's no channel, the boat's moving, we're like looking out for our own safety with big sets roaming over here, trying to get through and like punching through. You know, you got the Tahitian driver doesn't speak. Barely a lick of English, but you could always like yell at him when there was a set. We're constantly moving, 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 but Alex is missing like the biggest waves because he can't get to him in time. He caught a couple beautiful waves, but we missed the big ones. Next day we go out and we slide. This time we don't want to go past Chopes, we, so we take the inside route. And now we got to punch through waves. Like we got, there's a little channel here, but it's closing out. So I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, you know, we thought we had it. And sure enough, we get over one wave and I'm like, this next one's got us. We're fucked. Sure enough, my camera gear doused, everything. Had that Mark III, got completely soaked. So everything gets doused, we all get soaking wet. We had a red camera. So we get out there, I've got another camera back up, start shooting. So now we've been there, perfect wave another boat shows up. And I'm like, oh man, you gotta be kidding me. Like we've been sitting on this wave, it's actually the third day. And it's supposed to be the smallest day, but it's the biggest day. The sets are coming in, massive. And another boat shows up, it's Ian Walsh and Coco, uh, surfer from Mexico, down there in mainland Mexico. They show up, they paddle out. Lucky for us, it was very inconsistent. So sometimes it'd be an hour lull, and then a big one would come. So they caught a couple, got hammered, decided Chopes was much better, which it was, consistent-wise. They swim back to the boat, go back over there. I'm like, all right, sweet. But they had like, I remember they pulled in. We've been sitting here the whole time, and they pulled right in front of us. Now I'm shooting like through a boat. I've got a boat as my foreground. And then the wave. And I'm like, really? And they brought their own photographer, videographer. So now it's like we're fighting for a shot, and it's not where I want to be. And I'm like a little irritated, whatever. Right after they leave, this bomb comes in and it just shows itself. Luckily we had a jet ski, Alex could do a step off, gets right to it, he drops in, just perfect thing, does a huge bottom turn, hooks it, gets barreled, comes flying out, nailed that shot. We ended up staying out the entire day just because waves like that kept coming through. And we get back, I'm looking at him like, this is just, just this wave is so perfect. And he's like, well, we gotta send it to Surfer. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, but I read Surfer's journal more often. Maybe we should send it there. And he's like, no, Surfer, we gotta send it to Surfer. I was like, all right, fair enough. So he sent it to Surfer. I remember they called and they're like, yeah, these are great. Can we hold them? I was like, you can hold them. And I just was like, I tell you what, you can, you can do it, but I want, in five days, you gotta let me know if you're gonna use it or not. Because otherwise I'm flipping them somewhere else. So sure enough, calls me back, photo editor, and says, we want to use them, we're going to use them, can we keep these three? And I was like, all right, as long as you're using them, they're yours. So I kind of forget about it, a month goes by or so, I call him, can you use those shots? Yeah, yeah, no, we're going to use them, we're going to use them. We just don't know where yet, but we're using them soon, next issue, I think. Another month goes by, I'm like, man, this, that stuff still hasn't been used. Finally, this is like three months later, I call again, I'm like, what's up with the shots? They're coming out, next issue, they're gonna be out. So I'm thinking maybe a spread, whatever, I'm like, yeah, that'd be cool. And then uh, 
Alex got me, he shows up at the gallery and he had like the issue. And I, I didn't know, I didn't know it was gonna be the cover shot, but it was a huge surprise. My first cover was Surfer. And I've never considered myself a surf photographer, but when I was in college, I always wanted to be one. And then to nail the cover was pretty cool. Paramount had called me, left a message and said, hey, you know, we want you to shoot the next Mission Impossible. At first it was supposed to be a one week scenario in Morocco. Two days travel, five days shooting time. And we didn't know when I'd be working. So we kind of worked it out that they'd pay me for the whole time. We didn't really know if I'd shoot for one hour or five days, but I kind of had to charge for my whole, whole time that I was gonna be there not knowing what I was getting into. Their objective was for me to come in and shoot just the hardcore stunts, hoping to get a movie poster out of it. And so I get there in the middle of no man's land, flying uh, Marrakesh, and I take like an hour and a half bus ride up to the mountains, deep, deep in the mountains. And I arrive and I'm looking around, I'm like, we're up here. And I can't take any photos, I'm talking about social. I couldn't post where I was, I couldn't tell people what I was doing. Full NDA. Tom comes flying in a helicopter. It's like gorgeous. Comes walking out, you know, total professional, but ready to go. He's like ready to shoot. And action. And you can feel his like energy coming as he comes into the space. The publicist comes over, introduces, introduces us. Glad to have you here on set. Looking forward to working with you. You know, I don't know, it's really short and sweet, and that was it. Didn't see him again. He like right over to the director. They're talking about their next move. Here's what they're gonna do. I think the first shot was him on his magic carpet where he's getting like dragged through the space. And it was sketchy, like they're moving fast on a pulley and it was like he just fell off a motorcycle and he's falling and he's rolling and the carpet's moving. But if he rolled too far and went beyond the carpet, it was a heavy duty thing where he just raked him. There's dust and rocks and they got all the stuff on it and he's going like 20, 30 miles an hour while he's rolling on this thing. So that was my first shot. The next one is him on a motorcycle and he's pinning these turns through the mountains and he's going like 50 to 80 miles an hour. I'm going backwards in this weird contraption they call called the biscuit. And it's all roll bars with a race car driver on the front end, five seats on the back end looking out. Full like race cockpit style, five harness. Breathing apparatus, helmet gear, you know, like race cars, drivers going fast and there's no room for air. Like you fall off on the sides and you're going hundreds of feet straight off the edge of the cliff. And so I'm, again, I'm not thinking so much about the danger. I'm just looking at what I'm shooting, thinking about the composition and we're going backwards in time, you know, flying forward, but I'm shooting backwards. Tom's on the motorcycle. We've got a pyro guy. We've got this other electrician guy pulling this motorcycle, BMW motorcycle, as he comes around the corner and he's supposed to be fighting with this guy. He comes around the corner, real tight corner, he's banking a turn, the motorcycle gets pulled off and then explosion. You know, he's like, pins his turns. Like, knows he like bumped the guy. And that was like the whole shot I was trying to get. It took us five attempts to get the right timing. And it wasn't so much I was missing the shots, but it was, the timing would be off on the pulley a little too soon. So the explosion was small. Time frame I needed him, the explosion, all this in the shot. And other times it'd be too late. It'd already be like Phew. Five motorcycles later, we nail all the shot in one. And I was like, ah, oh, it's pretty sick, got the shot. So I'm like sitting on my laptop, kind of like editing and pulling the shots in. Director came by and saw me looks over my shoulder, he's like, oh, he's, you know, he was pretty excited about him. He's like, has Tom seen these yet? And I was like, no. He's like, he needs to come see him. Or you need to come show him. And I was like, yeah, all right, I'd love to. So I go in and he's got this little tent set up. I didn't think much of it at the time, but he's like, yeah, come sit down. And I sit down next to him and he starts looking at the pictures. He's like, I love this, it's great. And he's asking me like, 
really in-depth questions like about what camera I'm using, what lenses, what my shutter speeds are, stuff you just wouldn't think would come from him. And uh, he was really into it. We started talking about other things and he was just a really interesting, passionate guy. You could tell he's super passionate about what he's doing, very professional, and just wanted to know what you're doing, what you're doing here, and how he could utilize you to make this whole production. He's an executive producer, so he wants to make it look good too. So he's like, how long are you here for? And I was like, well, it's my first day, but I got like four more days, and then I gotta head back. And he's like, you think you can stay longer? I, I mean, I'd love to, I don't know. I think, you know, I gotta check my schedule, but also Paramount's paying me to be here. So we have to figure that out. And he's like, I'll talk to Paramount. You check your schedule, let's figure it out. I was like, all right. Three weeks later, I'm still there. So I got to hang out with him and I only had to shoot when the major stunts came. You know, we're in Marrakesh, or no, we had moved up to Casablanca for another scenario, and there's great surf. And Rabat, there's all these great surf spots, right? And I love to surf. So on the days I, I know I'm not really supposed to be shooting unless the stunt comes up, I had a full-time assistant who spoke Arabic and English. And so we had a driver, we'd go out, <laughs> go out to the beach, and I had him on the beach, the long lens, like my long lens, and I gave all the cell phones, we had all these different cell phones, I'd put them all on the, on the Pelican case there. And then I said, if anybody calls, you answer it immediately, like tell them we'll be right there, and you just start waving that towel. <laughs> so I'd be out surfing, and I'd be looking for the white towel, and if you ever waved it, I'd be like, <laughs> straight in, and we like head off the set. It actually never happened. So I, I got to surf quite a bit, which was incredible because I only had to like shoot when the action, the main stunts came on, and then I had this free time to like explore and shoot stuff. It was a great way to see Morocco and just really get to experience it. So yeah, that was like three weeks later, I flew home, long trip there, and then uh, I thought I was done. We got the shot on the motorcycle, which w went worldwide. I mean, it was on every single billboard, everywhere, worldwide. Him banking his turn, the explosion. Pretty proud moment for me to have that shot and, you know, see it everywhere I look. I don't know, they ended up calling me back three more times. They flew me back to England to shoot these stunts. And the last one we ended up doing was Tom hanging on the side of the airplane. So I knew what he was doing. I knew the stunt but I didn't know how I was gonna get the right shot, the right angle. And the whole scenario was really for me to get in a helicopter and fly next to him. I show up, I remember I flew straight from Utah. They picked me up in the car and they said, look, today's supposed to be a practice day, but if the weather's nice, Tom feels like shooting, he's gonna shoot, it's gonna be like go time. So I get there, I get on set, sure enough, he's like, well, it looks good, let's shoot. And everyone's scrambling, like all the directors, the videographer, everyone's like, gotta get the camera rigs, like on point. He goes up and he's literally hanging on the outside of this airplane. Like I know there was shots leaked, but no one really believed it. They all thought it was just double or something, but he did all his own stunts, which I had a lot of respect for. He could drive well, a motorcycle, car, you know, he's like, obviously he can run fast and he just gets into it. He did his own stunt, hanging on the side of the airplane, I get there, helicopter pilot's like, let me take a run first, see how it looks. He's got this, you know, huge Cineflex on the front, mounted, big, a lot of weight, and he's pushing that thing as fast as he can, trying to shoot, and he still can't keep up with the airplane. So he comes back and he's like, look, it's not gonna happen. I'm at red line, I'm at threshold. I put your body weight in here. It's gonna get real dangerous real fast. I'm just thinking in my head, like, the only reason I'm here is to get shots in this helicopter. But safety first, you know, I've got to oblige and I can't do anything about it. So I said, all right, I get it, I understand. I get in a ghillie suit, which was Simon Pegg in the opening of the movie. He's like out on the tarmac, he pops up and it's like him out there hiding. So I end up using his ghillie suit, they had already filmed that, to hide on. I was the only one out loud out on the tarmac and I'm shooting in the grass with like a long lens, hiding under his ghillie suit, trying to get these shots, take off and landing. Cool, but not like what we wanted. I wanted to show that vertigo feeling, like you're up here, I'm shooting down on him, he's hanging on the side of the plane. How do we get that? And so we're looking at all these scenarios. And so Tom comes to me like a day later, he's like, are you getting all the shots you need? And I said, I'm getting some shots, but I'm not really getting the shots. Like I need to be in the helicopter, I think. He's like, 
I thought you were in the helicopter. I was like, no, it was like red line. It says too dangerous. He's like, that's the first I've heard of this. He's on the radio. He's like, get a helicopter now. It's talking about pressure, right? Helicopter shows up 30 minutes later. Got my own helicopter. Now I got to get the shots. So we go up and I'm hanging out on the side of the helicopter shooting, you know, shooting photos. Again, it's not as cool as I was hoping. Cool backdrops. He's hanging on the side of the plane, but I'm still a little bit of a distance away. Like I'm not right on top of him. So we get those, I show him those. I'm like, look, it's so cool. It's cool, I like it, I like it. But I feel like I need to be on that plane with you, either strapped to the top or hanging out of those. There's only two windows on this air cargo plane. And they're both are being utilized by this welded in Cineflex camera. And then they mount on the backside that holds the whole weight. I said, the only way I think to get it is to take that whole thing out and then I hang out that window and shoot back at you. And in my head, I'm like, I can, I can get that shot. That's the shot I want to get. I can do it, but the whole thing's have to come out. He's like, let's do it. And the plane was $50,000 an hour to run it. Immense crew there, huge crew. We're running out of time. I remember it was like go time. It's like, all right, we got it out. It's your turn. Let's do it. I run and get on the plane. I, I told my assistant at the time, I was like, make sure you get photos of me hanging out inside this plane. I want my, I gotta have a shot of this. Like, I got it, I got it. So I grab my camera bag. I run and get on the plane. He calls me, he's like, dude, you took, you took all three camera bodies. I don't have a camera. I was like, run, run, get on the plane quick, come grab a camera. The director of the movie, Christopher McQuarrie, they're all on the plane, he's like, Shut the doors now, we're leaving, we're running out of time, we gotta go. Sure enough, now my assistant Doogie's sitting next to me. What do I do? You're on, buddy, you're in, you're on the plane. Door shut, so I've got no behind the scenes shots. I'm getting in, I got a harness I gotta put on, I got ropes, I got my camera tethered with a rope and duct tape to my hand. We start going, I like go to the airplane, guys like hoist me up, lift me out, I'm outside the airplane, this window is just big enough for my body to get through, but it's a fairly good size. Completely out, like I had bruises, I remember, on my thighs, I was so far out. Using all my like stomach muscles to hang sideways, perpendicular outside the plane, shooting backwards at them. We're going like 160 plus miles an hour. The wind's coming around, like this vortex around my face, hitting the eye cup of my camera, bouncing off the eye cup into my eyelid. My eyelid's flapping out to here. I can never see my eyelid, it's flapping like this. I'm like. I think I'm gonna lose my eyelid. I thought I was gonna rip. It was flapping so hard. And you know, when you do that, it creates tears when you just get some in your eye and you pull it down. Well, now I've got a cup full of like teardrops. So I'm basically looking with my eyes open in a swimming pool, trying to focus on Tom, who's like 15 feet behind me. And I'm just looking at a dark spot. Like I'm getting these shots. I'm getting these shots. Like I know where he is, but I'm looking and it's all blurred. Remember coming back in the plane, everything, I'm freezing. It's like late October early November and I'm, it's pretty cold in Northern England. Trying to clear out my, I mean, soaking, it's just like a pool, I'm like dumping out. Gotta go back out, Whew, back out. Eyelids flapping, I'm shooting these spots. <laughs> and then anyhow, we got the shot and that was what, that was another movie post they used for like the vertical scenario. Yeah, it was a pretty neat shot for me. <laughs>